often in the middle of a funeral, we will hear Psalm 23. And often when this happens, I will point out a miracle in the psalm that once you see, you can't unsee. It was shown to me by the writings of Reverend Kenning's seminary colleague, Walter Brueggemann. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. God makes us lie down in green pastures and leads us beside still waters. And we know that, and we need that, and we love that. But this psalm isn't just a meadow and a lake. The Lord is leading us through the wilderness, through the valley of the shadow of death, through the sharp terror of grief that lurks and pounces on the ones we love. If trauma were a place, it would be the wilderness. Now, just about everybody knows the wilderness is haunted by angels and wild beasts. You might meet up with the devil. You might meet the person you have been missing most in all the world. In the wilderness, forgiveness might hunt you down and knock you to the ground. And when you look up, you will think you are seeing the face of God. It's happened before. And to some degree, all of this makes sense. This isn't the miracle yet. But here, in the 23rd Psalm, in the middle of the wilderness, you'll never guess what God has gone and gotten up to, except you might. In the middle of the trauma, there's the miracle. God has set up a table and laid out a feast. And the best way I can imagine this is like if you're on the highway and you suddenly saw a flash mob Thanksgiving. Here I am in the middle of a funeral telling the people about a table. What's it even doing here? Sure doesn't belong. And I know that we are not at a funeral right now. You are tuning into this church service, and I'm glad that you are. But I also know, whoever you are and wherever you are on life's journey, right now you are in the wilderness, and I am too. It could be the season of Lent is your wilderness. It could be depression or grief. It could be the pandemic, which seems like it should be all over by now, and it just keeps going on and on. I wonder what all we have lost in the past year. Well, actual people, for one, but we've also lost parts of ourselves. I wonder if things will ever go back to normal because that's what we say we want. But I gotta tell you, I don't know. What I can tell you for sure is that all of us are in the wilderness. It puts you and me at risk of meeting up with sorrow and with angels of following God through the shadows and getting hunted down by mercy? Right here, God has gone and laid out a table with a feast. And look, it is not your fault. It is not mine either. It was not our idea to get out of the car right here. But there is a table in the road. And this table is a fact. And this table is laying a claim on your soul and on mine. And now what are we going to do? Today, the scripture that Karen read arrives like canisters on your counter. Three splendid parables that come as a set. 
Now, any Bible scholar worth their salt will tell you a parable is not an Aesop's fable. So don't go rooting around in a parable expecting to find the moral of the story. The purpose of a parable is to induce the kingdom of heaven, not leave us with a clear action item. This is what the Bible scholars tell us, and they are right, mostly. It's just, I really think this particular trio of tales really might be charged with a shining imperative. It really seems like there's something we're supposed to do. But let's see what you think. What happened was the scribes and Pharisees were grumbling because Jesus had been eating with tax collectors and sinners. You can imagine the unauthorized dinners, the tables popping up in places where they don't belong. So Jesus tells them. First, a shepherd had 100 sheep when one of them goes missing. Now a lost sheep injects distress into the flock. So the other sheep begin huddling and buying. They know something's wrong. So without even thinking, the shepherd takes off, determined to find the one who's lost. And you want to know what he does. But when he sees the lost sheep, that's when it occurs to him. He has gone and left 99 sheep to fend for themselves back in the wilderness. So with this lost sheep on his shoulders, the shepherd is blaming himself the whole way back. The first miracle is he found that missing sheep and it wasn't even hurt. But the other miracle is when he gets back to the flock, he finds the other sheep are also unharmed. All 100 are together and okay. And he not even realized that he had been holding his breath until the hallelujah came whooshing out. So now you know what he has to do. Next. A woman lit the lamp and swept the house, searching for the coin she had lost. And the whole time she is sweeping and searching, she is cursing herself. This money was important. She wanted to be smart, so she hid each of her 10 coins in a separate location. And this way, if thieves ever broke into her house and found one or even two of the coins, the chances are they wouldn't find all of the money. Only problem is, she forgot where she hid the last coin. Now the first miracle is her search works. She finds the 10th coin. But the other miracle is that when she does, she finds some part of herself that she hadn't even realized was missing. This woman finds her own forgiveness. So come on, now we know. We know what she has got to do. And there's this. The father knew as soon as his son took off that this was a mistake. But what was he supposed to do? Here his younger son is thrilled to be heading off into the world, dreams in his head, money in his pockets. The light flickered in his father's eyes and I am telling you, the old man knew he had lost his son. Giving his younger son his inheritance was practically signing his death warrant And if you want to know what kind of father can allow his own son to just go to his death, yeah, we could ask God. Well, in this story, the first miracle is the son gets up from the dead. The Bible says he came back to himself. 
And in a very strange turn of sequence, which I hope you'll remember, in this man's resurrection, the younger son found repentance. He came back home. The other miracle happens later. The older son charged at his dad with tears in his eyes. How could you do this? He has gone and ruined everything. I have stayed here and worked so hard. How could you go and throw him a party? And when the old man told his firstborn son, a claim has been laid upon us. You know what we have to do. I'm not saying the older brother was happy to agree, not at all. But the other miracle is that when the father explained this, I think the older son believed him. I really do. I think he saw the light return to his father's eyes. And okay, for just a minute, can you imagine being one of these folks' neighbors? I mean, here you are, living your life, having a Tuesday when your phone rings and it's your neighbor and your neighbor is out of breath. It's urgent. You have got to come and help. Quick, log on to Zoom. Find any ice cream you have in the back of your freezer. We are having a party and we need you to drop what you're doing. I don't know if you have ever been summoned to an emergency celebration, but this is what actually happens to the neighbors in the Bible story. They really do show up and find there's a table with a feast. In the middle of the parable, in the middle of the wilderness, there's a table. And I can't even protect you from it. The table is laying a claim on your soul and on mine. The food is hot. The band is ready. The Lord looks at you with a here. Let me refill your glass. So come on. What are you going to do? All through the gospel, we hear Jesus predict his death. And as the author of Luke tells it, again and again, Jesus warns the disciples that the cross is coming. And again and again, the disciples don't understand. And really, I mean, how could they? But here's what I'm wondering. Maybe this time, maybe in this particular splendid trio of parables, Jesus isn't trying to help us get ready in our hearts for his torture and his execution. Maybe Jesus is trying to prepare us for what's going to come after. Because can you imagine if he goes and gets up from the dead and we don't even have a celebration ready? What if this is when we need to be getting ready to come back to life. I know I have been talking about coming back to life in just about every sermon I have preached this Lent and before it, and I probably will keep on talking about coming back to life for the foreseeable future, and as much as I talk about it, this question of what will it mean for me to come back to life this is a real question that is rising up in my heart, which makes me think there's a good chance it's a real question rising up in your heart. And you're right. The timing couldn't be worse. It is the middle of Lent. It is the middle of a pandemic. Normally, we would prefer to save the party until after all the hard part. This is why it feels so strange to be describing a festive celebration in the middle of a funeral. But what if the gospel is messing with the sequence on purpose? What if it's not only the case that our repentance can lead to our resurrection, but what if it works the other way around? 
What if coming back to life changes how we live? The first miracle is we might find ourselves getting up from the dead or getting up from the grief, whatever your wilderness is. But the other miracle is that this is going to change our minds. It's going to change our hope that things will just go back to normal. Now we will need another reason to live and we'll have one. The first miracle is how God pours forgiveness from her spirit into ours. The other miracle is that we might forgive ourselves. You might forgive you. And are you even ready for that? You and I know we are still in the middle of the wilderness. Weeping may linger for the night, they tell us, and they're right, and it's still night. But it could be that even here, even before things are all better, there is an impulse in your heart that is longing to praise God. And all I'm saying is that you are right. Your own rejoicing that had gone missing you might be finding it back. The first miracle is that right in the middle of the middle, God has gone and set up a table of peacemaking. And sure, it doesn't belong in the street, but here it is. This table is laying a claim to your soul and to mine, so go call the neighbors. The table is the first miracle. The other miracle? Well, that's up to us. Thanks be to God. Amen.